you look at the Congressional Budget Office's long-term debt projections, our debt just explodes. It goes up to 100% of GDP, which is about the level it was at the end of World War II, and then <laughs> keep, keep, keeps on going from there. At the end of World War II, uh, we had a, a high level of debt and we survived it, and maybe it's not such a bad thing, but actually, at the end of World War II, we had an enormous amount of savings, plus we had this huge peace dividend. It was easy for the government to cut spending, and it kept taxes relatively high for a while. And still, there was a pretty significant recession uh, as a result of the, the fiscal adjustment, and it took a while to get the debt level back down. The problem is that all of the pressures on the government right now are just pushing the debt higher and higher and higher. We obviously need to change things. How much current spending should we foist on our children to you know, make them pay with interest? Uh, right now, deficit spending seems almost costless because the government can borrow a very, very low interest rate. Short-term rates are about 1%. Uh, that's not going to persist forever. And as our debt level increases, the, the risk that investors would decide that U.S. government bonds were junk rather than the safest investment in the world becomes very, very high. You might think, well, that couldn't happen overnight, but in fact, that's exactly what happened in the subprime mortgage market. And my concern is that actually what's happening in the government bond market is very much like what was happening in the subprime market, that there's a bubble that investors say, well, as long as interest rates are 1% or 2%, percent U.S. government is good for lots more debt, so we can lend to them, and it's a safe investment, kind of like subprime mortgages were a safe investment as long as housing prices were growing at 10% a year. Uh, but if interest rates started to go up, if there was some perception that there was a higher risk of default by the U.S. government, you could have this spiral where interest rates would explode overnight, uh, and then we would be basically bankrupt. It's hard to predict exactly what would happen, but there's this nice survey that was done by uh, uh, Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff, two economists, uh, where they looked at debt crises through the world and, and, and over, over the ages. And what they discovered is that when there's a debt crisis, it typically comes with very, very high inflation. On average, for countries that have debt denominated in their own currencies, the price level goes up by about 9,000 percent. That means that you know, if it happened in the U.S., that a dollar would become worth about a penny. And my concern is that actually in, in, the, US, in the case of the U.S., it would be even worse than, say, in Greece or other small countries because if we went down, we'd bring the rest of the world down with us, and it could very well trigger a global depression. But President Obama has a really difficult political challenge. I mean, we've created this environment where telling the truth about, our, uh, about the difficult choices that we face is deemed to be political suicide. The only way we can deal with uh, the, the debt problem is to raise taxes and cut spending. And both of those things are unpopular. Even though people say they want to they, 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 they want to cut government spending, they're talking about spending that doesn't apply to them. And the big programs do, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, highways, things like that. But the things you need to do to get the budget under control are very difficult. They involve cutting popular programs, raising taxes, and people don't like that. Now, we're the only major developed country that doesn't have a value-added tax. A value-added tax is a kind of sales tax collected at the national level. The advantage of a value-added tax is that it's a significant source of revenue for every other country, every other country except for the U.S. Uh, it's more conducive to economic growth because it taxes spending and not saving. And even though in the short term we want people to spend more over the long term, we also have a basically a crisis that individuals aren't saving enough. The saving rate is about 1% of income, and it's about at a historic low. Uh, so the theory is that if we shifted reliance from income taxes, which tax the returns to savings as well as, as spending, uh, to uh, a consumption tax like a value-added tax, that we'd encourage people to, to, to spend less and save more, and that would be more conducive to economic growth. Uh, the drawback of a value-added tax is that it's regressive. By that, I mean that it's, it takes a much larger share of income from lower-income people than from those with high incomes. Low-income people spend all of their income or even more. They, they get help from relatives or others. High-income people spend only a fraction of it. 
Uh, Larry Summers used to joke that when conservatives figure out that a VAD is regressive and liberals figure out that it's a money machine, there will finally be a deal. <laughs> the reason I think a value-added tax dedicated to paying for health care is a good idea is, first of all, the, our long-term budget problem is primarily about health care, that health care costs are growing much faster than the rest of the economy, and we don't have any plausible way to pay for it. So if we had a tax that was earmarked to paying for health care, we would, at least in principle, be dealing with uh, the long-term budget problem, at least as long as the connection can be maintained. Uh, if you had a value-added tax that was tied to health care costs, then people would see that if health care costs continue to grow without limit, the, the VAT rate would, would increase. Presumably, people wouldn't like that. It also deals with a conservative critique, which I think is valid, that a lot of low-income people don't pay income tax, and therefore, for them, it appears that the government is free. If you had a value-added tax that was paid by everybody, they, then the, everyone would have a stake in trying to slow down to slow down, slow down government spending. I mean, the, the the fact is that we're very reliant on foreign lenders that don't necessarily share our values. Uh, right now, it's in their interest to keep on lending us money, and the reason is that the money they lend us goes right back to them. If China lends us money we effectively spend it at Walmart to buy their stuff. The OPEC countries lend us money, we spend it at the gas station. You know, one of the things that's a little bit scary to think about is that what brought down the Soviet Union was, was basically debt, that they, they spent more on, on defense than, than they could pay for, and ultimately it caused the economy to collapse. Uh, we cheered that in the United States. It's a little scary to think that the Chinese or other countries might might have a similar mindset with respect to the money that they're lending us. Even if there's not an overt threat from those countries to, to try to create a crisis in the U.S., it gives us a lot less latitude in dealing with them. And that's really very frightening. I mean, what happens 20 years down the road if, you know, assuming we've accumulated enormous amounts of debt and that the only thing keeping us afloat is the is Chinese investment, if China decides actually they don't want Taiwan to be an independent, an independent entity anymore, 